Hello everybody again, for some of you, and welcome for the first time for others of you. Welcome to the National Science Week event, this is our fourth one, run by Mount Bennett Observatory in conjunction with CASTRO, the ARC Centre of Excellence for All Sky, oh, astrophysics. Um, our second speaker tonight is Emily, soon to be Dr. Emily Petrov. She's going to be talking about first radio bursts, and it will probably follow on from the previous talk of Yep. Make her welcome. Hello, everybody. So, as she mentioned, my name is Emily Petrov, and I'm a PhD student at Swinburne right now. So I'm doing my PhD here in Australia, originally from the United States, but the radio astronomy is better here, so that's, that's why I'm here talking to you tonight. So Ewan already talked a little bit about radio telescopes and how we're going to be building bigger and better radio telescopes with the square kilometer array. I'm going to be talking about some very interesting work that I've been doing, so some new discoveries that have come out of current radio telescopes, specifically about discoveries that we've made at the Parkes Radio Telescope, which is out in New South Wales. And this, this new discovery that we have is called fast radio bursts, or FRBs. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what they are and then how we find them. So what is a fast radio burst? What am I talking about? Well, fast radio bursts, FRBs, it's all in the name. So fast, they, they only last for milliseconds. So blink and you miss it. And radio, well, that means that we detect them in radio light. So light that we can't see with our own eyes but that can be picked up with radio telescopes like the Parkes Radio Telescope and the Arecibo Radio Telescopes. They're big dishes that collect lots of radio light. And by burst, well, it's kind of what you think. It's an explosion. It's a, fa it's a bright flash of light that we only see for a millisecond or two milliseconds, and then we don't see it ever again. So show of hands, who has heard of a supernova? Excellent. So supernovae typically happen in optical lights. That's light that we can see with our own eyes. So if you look through a telescope and a supernova happened, you would see what originally just looks like a blank sky, and then you'd see a bright flash, and then it would be gone. That's exactly the same thing that we see in the radio light for these fast radio bursts. It's a little bit different, and I'm going to explain why, but that's the same idea. It's this bright flash and then nothing. Well, that's kind of a mystery. We didn't know we were going to see these. We were originally looking through our radio telescopes for pulsars. We were looking for things in our own galaxy that we understand very well, that are very regular. They spin. We expected to see these, but we didn't expect to see these bright flashes. So where do they come from? Well, we're still trying to figure that out, actually. <laughs> that's, that's part of the research that I'm doing at Swinburne. So nobody actually knows for sure where these fast radio bursts come from. We think that they must come from somewhere where it's some sort of very energetic explosion or a flare of some kind. But what we do think we know is that they come from all the way across the universe. So we actually think that they come from stars and galaxies that are halfway across the universe, three quarters of the way across the universe. They're very far away. What could produce something so energetic so far away? Well, we think it might be something really exotic. So we're thinking not like a supernova, but something that makes something that looks like a supernova, but in the radio. So um, maybe some type of explosion, like uh, a star exploding or a flare. So we know these things called magnetars. They're like pulsars, but they, they're known to emit these very strong bursts of radiation. So we think maybe a magnetar in another galaxy could flare and we would see an FRB. But what we do know is that they happen a lot. So let's see if my movie will play. Yeah, all right. So if we're looking with our Parkes Radio Telescope, are we gonna, here we go, we see some FRBs happening in the background. So let's see, there we go, okay. So we think, we think that there are 10,000 FRBs happening all across the whole sky every day. So that's one every 10 seconds. So by the time I'm finished giving this talk, we would have had maybe 15 or 20 or you know, many, many FRBs happening. And and so we're, we're hoping that if we point our radio telescopes in the right place, we'll see these flashes. And that's what we've been doing. So it's very new science. There's only about 13 of these FRBs that we've ever seen before. The first one was discovered in 2007. And since then, we found four more that were published in 2013. So that's 13 in total across the entire sky. So we're looking for these things, but they're kind of hard to find because all of our telescopes have a very small field of view. So you have to point at one point 
for a really long time to see one FRB. But all of our FRBs up until now, all of our fast radio bursts were found in archived data. So these are, these are surveys that we did across the sky looking for pulsars, and then we archived it on our, on our computers. And then since these things have become kind of interesting, everyone's gone back and looked for them in the data and they found more and more. But that's kind of disappointing, right? You, you would want to be able to find it immediately. You'd want to say, oh, we found something and we can do something about it. Well, we weren't able to do that because some of these were found a few years, up to 10 years after they actually happened. And at that point, you can't do much that's exciting with these, with these objects. So what would really, really be cool is if we could find a fast radio burst in real time. If we could point our telescope and have the capability to see it happen and do something. And we've, it, we've finally done that. So we have the first real-time FRB that happened at Parks a couple of months ago. This was while I was observing. Well, actually, I wasn't observing. <laughs> it was for my project. Um, but my, uh, my supervisor was observing. And we now have the capability at our telescope to be able to detect these things immediately. And it sends you an email, conveniently enough. It says, hey, I found you an FRB. Um, and, and it did this. So um, I got this email 20 seconds after the fast radio burst had happened. And so we did something about it. For the first time ever, we could do something about it. For supernovae, what they like to do is if somebody sees a supernova, they tell everyone that they know. And everyone points at the supernova to see what happens next. And this time we were able to do this with a fast radio burst. So we emailed everyone we knew, we called everyone we knew, we texted everyone we knew, we tried to get everyone to look at this patch of sky, and in the end we got 12 telescopes that were involved in this project to look at that patch of sky and, and see what they could see. So we, were, we originally found it at Parks in the radio, and so we got other radio telescopes around the world to look at it too. But we also got optical telescopes to look at uh, at optical light to see if it looked something like a supernova, since we don't know if it's going to look like a supernova or not. So we got optical telescopes to look at it, and we even got a satellite called SWIFT, which observes in the X-rays. We can't, we don't detect X-rays on Earth because the atmosphere protects us from them. But we got the SWIFT telescope orbiting orbiting the Earth to look for X-rays as well. And so it's just a phenomenal effort. So I, I didn't expect all, this, all these people to be so excited about this, but luckily, we got lots and lots of people to look at the sky. And kind of, it was kind of exciting. We didn't know what we were going to see. We hoped that we would see something flash or something changing, and we could pinpoint exactly where it was and say exactly what caused it. Well, sorry to disappoint you in this talk, but we didn't see anything. And that's almost as exciting. <laughs> Um, in science, you know, we're, we're so interested not only in, in what we expect, but finding the unexpected. And fast radio bursts are a great example of this. We didn't expect them at all. And now we're not really sure what to expect from, from follow-up or from further science. So we looked with our radio telescopes, with our optical telescopes, with our X-ray telescopes, and we didn't see anything changing. We expected that if it's like a supernova, then you might expect an afterglow of some sort, where you see, after the bright flash fades, the outward flowing gas, or the, the shell of the star, as it cools down, it starts emitting light, and that light gets dimmer and dimmer over time. So you would see an afterglow, where you see a bright peak of light, and then it fades and fades. We didn't see one of those. So it's probably not like a normal supernova explosion, if that's where these fast radio bursts are coming from. We also didn't see anything like a gamma ray burst, which is like a supernova, but happens in the gamma rays and the X-rays at really high energies. And these come from different types of stars that implode and create a jet of light. And we see gamma rays all the way across the universe. So we thought maybe FRBs, maybe fast radio bursts are like gamma ray bursts, and we might expect to see some type of gamma ray emission. We didn't see that either. So this is nothing like what we were expecting. I was really expecting that we would see something cool and be able to, you know, tell you all about it tonight, but unfortunately, we're still looking. We still don't know exactly what they are. We have lots of theories, and, and uh, you know, we're, we're all actively researching in this area, but, but really, the, the important thing to do is to keep looking. So this is what I'm working on in the next year or so of my PhD, is to keep looking for these things, keep using telescopes like Parks, and eventually, since these things happen so often, since we think they happen 10,000 
times over the entire sky every day. Telescopes like the SKA, the Square Kilometer Array that Ewan talked about, has such a big field of view and it's going to be so sensitive that it will see thousands of fast radio bursts every day. So right now we're working on getting all of our equipment ready, making sure we understand what types of things we're looking for, how we're going to coordinate between telescopes like parks, like the SKA, and optical telescopes or x-ray telescopes. Um, and we're, that's basically you know, what we're working on now is getting everything prepared, making sure we understand these things so when the SKA does come around, we're going to be able to do some amazing science with these things. We're going to be able to learn about cosmology. We're going to be able to map the matter of the universe. We're going to be able to measure the magnetic field of the universe with the SKA and fast radio bursts. There's so much cool stuff that's in store with these things, and it's going to be incredible. So I'm, I'm sorry that I can't give you a more definite answer about what they are, but it's an exciting field of research, and I'm sure um, more exciting results will come out soon. So be sure to keep watching the news. All right. Um, that's all, I'll leave you with that. Thank you. <laughs> We have, you might get a ball. Those of you who already got a ball from the last talk might not get another one. I'll we have goodies for questions. <laughs> have to be really good yeah. Um, if you did see one and something did happen after, yeah. Um, what would you do? If we saw one, um, <laughs> yeah, I would be very excited. Um, so we would continue to observe it. Um, so if we saw the fast radio burst happen at parks, and then we looked at it with a whole bunch of other telescopes. We would try to observe it for as long as possible and see if, if that thing faded the way we expect, or if there's some type of other physics going on there. Um, yeah, you have like a limited time frame, because once it disappears, it's, it's gone forever. Um, but yeah, hopefully if we did see something, we just observe it for as long as possible. Yeah, oh, definitely. There you go. Got a question at the back. Um, when, it, when you said the 12 telescopes turned around, uh, yeah. it took 20 seconds for you to get the email, you sent it out. What time did it take for all those telescopes to focus on that? Yeah. So because we weren't quite ready this time, no one was <laughs> there, first of all, um, we have a big survey going on at Parks right now called SUPERB. This is just an acronym. But, um, so we expected that we would find lots of FRBs in SUPERB. My project was kind of like a side project where I was just kind of, I was doing something else. And then one of these things happened. So nobody was ready. I wasn't ready. Everyone was kind of flustered. So um, the first telescope that got on, on source after Parks was the Australia Telescope Compact Array, or ATCA, which is, let's see, here we go, is here. And then after that, the next thing, it got on source within a couple of hours. Then after that, it was eight hours until the next object got on. Yeah. So minutes. No. Yeah. So we're still in the we're still in the in the like the because we'd never done it before. This is like kind of a trial run. Um, it was like it was hours. Some telescopes got on days after. So we're hoping that the next time around, because we have this, we're confident that our trigger takes like ten seconds. We're hoping that in the future we'll have other telescopes on within minutes. Was that worth the ball? Even though it's not a kid. Yeah. yeah. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. You said you have some theories what they might be. Yeah. Is, could it be linked in any way to dark energy? Um, perhaps. So some people have actually, not maybe not dark energy, but some people have speculated that it could be um, fast radio bursts could come from filaments. Um, Colliding, so that would be like dark matter type filaments colliding, and that, that collision would create fast radio bursts. But it's probably more likely to be due to something made of matter, something that either explodes or flares or something like that. Um, that, yeah, so it's probably, yeah, it's more likely to be matter than to be dark energy or dark matter. Okay. You want to ball for that? I already <laughs> okay, I was saying, go ahead. So the furthest FRB that we've ever found was in redshift terms, which I'll talk about. <laughs> redshift terms was a redshift of 1.5, which means that we were looking back in time to about half the age that the universe is now. So it was six billion years ago. Oh gosh. <laughs> 
Uh, let's Google it. <laughs> so it was, it was furthest away than the close galaxies. It was furthest away, or further away than even the galaxies that are in our, our local group. It was, it was way, way far away. Um, I guess at about, what we would say, gigaparsecs. So it's billions of light years. I, can, I don't want to throw that far, but you should come down and get a ball after this. <laughs> yeah? What's, how far is the closest one? The closest one is at a redshift of 0.4. So that's actually 0.3. Um, so that's only about half a gigaparsec. So we're talking about um, a little bit beyond our local group. So we're looking back a little bit in time, but not very far. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, so we wanted all the telescopes to look at the sky just in case. So we had a whole bunch of different telescopes that could see different types of light. So we were normally looking at it with a telescope that could see radio light. But we wanted to look at it with telescopes that could see the same light that our eyes can see, or to see in infrared light, or to see in x-ray light, just in case it, just in case it's not just radio light, in case there is some type of other light that we didn't, that we haven't seen before. So we wanted all the telescopes that we could to look at it, just in case there was some other type of light there. Yep. Um, what's the gamma you're right, it doesn't. So it's, the, it's called GROND, and it's the Gamma Ray Burst Optical and Near Infrared Detector. That's what it stands for. And it's not actually a telescope. It's an instrument that goes on the back of a telescope, and it looks for infrared light coming from the sky. So um, I didn't have a picture of the actual telescope that it's attached to, because that telescope uses a whole bunch of different detectors. But this grand instrument is just one of those detectors on the telescope. Yeah. Do you have a ball? All right. Well, that can be fixed. All right. Here we go. Yep. Why would the SKA telescope detect them easier? Yeah, so the SKA is going to be more sensitive than parks, and it's going to have a bigger field of view than parks. So because they happen, so many of them happen over the whole sky every day, if the SKA can see a big patch of sky and it can see really far away, it's going to see lots and lots of these FRBs just in one pointing. Whereas with parks, because the field of view is so small, we have to wait kind of a long time before, before we see an FRB. One last question. Uh, oh boy. <laughs> I'm going to go for the little one here. How many types of lights could all these telescopes say I'm sorry? Yeah, okay, so um, let's see. Because there's different types of radio light, too, um, we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven different types of light that we could see. So we were looking at really low radio waves, medium sized radio waves. Um, we had optical telescopes looking at two different types of optical light that our eyes can see, so some red types of light and some blue types of light. And then we had infrared light and x-ray light. Did I miss one? I might have missed one. <laughs> All right. Um, thank Emily Petrov. <laughs>